our first Monday lecture this evening with George Lakey. Um, we're very pleased to have George with us again. He's not a newcomer to Pendle Hill. I don't know how many times you've spoken here, George, but again, the occasion for this one is the publication of George's new book, How We Win, um, which I think is going to be a, a useful um, antidote to whatever the elections may bring us tomorrow. If we can slightly put the brakes on, that will be great, but uh, using nonviolent direct action campaigning, as George will let us know tonight through some of the stories he's going to tell us, is fits our liberation theme both on a personal level as well as advancing the social justice aims that we have in our hearts. Um, I think we've caught you just in the midst of your tour, right? Have you been away already and you're, the, the launch, it launches here. And I can't think of a better place because you're off to a Seattle or Northwest someplace very soon, like maybe even tomorrow, <laughs> but soon. So the books um, are available. We we're very pleased that George was able to secure them, even if our bookstore wasn't. They'll be on sale afterwards. And uh, also, after all of the signing of the books is over, George, if he still has any energy left, which he probably will because this is energizing, um, will uh, play the piano for us so we can do some Broadway sing-along. So, yay, it's going to be a full evening with a lot of vigor. We'll, we'll be all ready to go out and cast our ballots tomorrow. So I don't think most of you will need an introduction to George, and what you get will probably be um, you'll catch his story from the stories that he's going to tell you. But he's been an activist his entire life, and it's been a long life. And trying to summarize it easily in short form is not going to work very well. But I do recommend several of his books, but the, the one before this, Viking Economics, went into second, third printing even. It was so popular, and it showed how the Scandinavians successfully transformed their society from incredibly repressive, oligarchically controlled uh, societies into very happy, democratically um, uh, operated and socially just enterprises for everybody. The common good was definitely there. So that's another one I'd recommend. Um, He's traveled to all of the continents, taught nonviolent um, direct action training to thousands of people in workshops, both here and in all f five continents at least. Um, so we're very pleased to have such a famous person as um, George connected with us. And he would like to speak out of the silence. So I would invite friends first to turn off your cell phones beepers, anything that makes noise, and center into a period of uh, silent worship, and George will speak to us out of that. Um, and I'll remind you, I guess, also that when I come around with this microphone after George has spoken, uh, we are being live streamed and recorded. So if you would wait to ask your question until I arrive with the microphone, that will allow all of us in the room and our folks at home to hear the question as well as the answer. So let's settle into silence.
Good evening. So happy to be able to launch this, what will probably be a year-long book tour at my second home, Pendle Hill. <laughs> this is a great, a great spot to be doing it. In the early 60s, in nearby Chester, which was at that time a real industrial city, there was a major direct action campaign going on that I was watching from West Philly, where I was living, still am. And I was noticing the photographs and the, uh, on, in the press and on TV, uh, the pictures of the struggle showed all these black people in the streets, in sit-ins, in the school board and so on, because the school uh, situation was very segregated, city council and so on. All these pictures showed black people struggling for freedom from racism, and it occurred to me, anybody looking at those pictures might think that racism is a, a black people's problem. But what an absurd idea. I mean, it was actually white people who invented racism. I'm, I'm pretty sure there weren't people in Africa, black people in Africa saying, life is so boring here, you know, we, we're, we're we're, we're living in our societies, uh, you know, far away from the vexations of World War II and so on and so on. And uh, wouldn't it be nice to have racism and have something to really work on? I'm pretty sure it didn't happen that way. And, and, and yet, it wasn't white people who were doing the heavy lifting to deal with this racist um, city nearby called Chester. I thought, well, that's outrageous. I better do something about that. So I came out to volunteer to join the movement. It was the first time I was volunteering uh, in a movement that was almost guaranteed to get you arrested. And I was pretty nervous about it, but I did have a set of expectations about how it would go. It can be dangerous to have expectations. So first of all, I get to where I understand the campaign headquarters to be. It's a storefront on a business uh, street in Chester. And there were a lot, rows and rows of folding chairs and people were sitting there and there was a desk in the front and there was a, and that person I soon discovered by sitting in the chair was a dispatcher who would call for, we need five people now, now we need 10 people and people would come forward and they would be dispatched to get arrested there or get arrested there or get arrested there. I said, whoa, this is way different understanding of organization than I expected. I thought somehow it would be in a chapel and there would be stirring sermons and then we would all march off together. But this was, a, a, it looked bureaucratic to me, but I, I, who am I to know? It's, it's certainly well organized. And then uh, at, at some point um, they said, now we, need, uh, now we need five people. And I jumped up and, uh, and they said, uh, you have a car. We see that you, when you signed in, you signed in, you had a car. So you should take these other four people and go to city hall and go inside and get arrested. Okay, so we go out and jump in the car. So that was when I made my first mistake. I drove to City Hall, which was surrounded by police <laughs> and mass media and picketers, and there was no parking anywhere near City Hall. <laughs> what was I to do with the car? So. But my, my car mates were very excited about, go, go, go. You know, so they said, let us out, let us out. And I said, and then uh, the second uh, big moment happened when I realized how terrified I was of being alone in this. I was counting, actually I was imagining there'd be hundreds of us that would be at any given place at any given time. And the very idea of being dispatched in smart, small groups uh, was a little scary, but the idea that they would leave me and I would be alone to get arrested was just plain terrifying. So I said, look, I want you to promise you won't go in there until I get back, okay? Okay, 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 we'll wait for you. So, of course, it took a while to find a place far enough away that I could leave my car safely for who knows how many days or nights, you know, I'd be gone. Uh, and I make my way back to City Hall, and, and I think, where are they? My gang, my gang is gone, my comrades are disappeared. They must have gone in ahead anyway. So I just walk right up the steps, 
you know, through the police line, through the media line, through the picketers, um, just uh, no problem getting in for me uh, because I'm a white guy and I had, of course, a white shirt on and a tie because in those days we wanted to present a really good appearance for such a special occasion. So uh, obviously the police thought I'd come to pay my water bill or something. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm just sort of striding up the steps and into the, the and the place is dark. It's dim, dim, dark. And um, nobody's around. My comrades aren't there. I see a few police on the far end of the, of the big lobby. I think, oh, they're, they're in one of the offices already. Damn. So I start looking in the different offices, but they're all locked. No employees there. This is nothing like what I expected was going to happen. So finally, uh, the police amble over, and one of them says, since I'm obviously clueless and lost, um, how can we help you? <laughs> you know, f figuring if it was the water bill, you know, they would say, try next week or something like that. And I said, well, I've, I've, come, to, I've come to sit in. I'm part of the civil rights movement. I've come to sit in. And they looked at me like, and so one of them said, well, pull up a tile and sit down. <laughs> I said, what, anywhere? <laughs> Be my guest. <laughs> so I sat down. So then uh, he said, okay, now you can get up and go home and tell your friends that you're a hero. I said, oh, no. No, no, I am serious about this. Oh, you're serious about this, are you? Okay, he mentions to the uh, other two guys who grab me, pick me up, throw me against the wall, start doing the classic pat down. I thought, oh, now this is getting to be a little bit more like what I expected. So <laughs> there was some, some relief to that. And, uh, and then they, uh, they were wa walked me over to a, a corner exit kind of place, and the, the, these two guys started debating with each other about should they just march me over to the holding cells in the nearby jail, or should they wait till the police bus comes and load me onto the police bus? Big mistake again. I made so many mistakes. This mistake was I had an opinion. I said, oh, I'll be glad to walk. <laughs> Helpful, George. And that reminded them how completely pissed off they were at working incredible hours day after day after day with all this disruption, never seeing their families, really exhausted, and with all these you know, disruptive, difficult people. And here is this big white guy, totally clueless, and just giving us mouth. And so one of them started beating me. So I thought, oh, okay, now this is what I expect. So it was back and forth because surprise and, ex and expectation. And I knew what to do. I knew unlock my knees and r relax and start praying. And that's what I did. And then the uh, other guy said, oh, you can stop that. Let him go. So they, uh, they decided to, after all, take me outside. By which time a police bus had come and they put me on the bus. So I thought, okay, and on the bus there were a lot of other people on their way to jail. And uh, I sat down next to a guy who was bleeding like crazy from his nose. And uh, I said, whoa, what happened to you? It was a young guy. And he said, oh, well, um, they, I'm, uh, I, they thought I was a student, so they really let me have it. Because Swarthmore students were famous in that struggle for going over there and making trouble. And uh, he said, so you know, they really let me have it with a bully club right across the nose. But actually, I'm a Philadelphia Bulletin reporter just uh, out here reporting. And uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. So they, uh, they took us to jail. Well, I spent a week there. Actually, they went uh, right to Broadmeadows uh, Prison. I don't know if anybody knows Broadmeadows <laughs> Prison anymore. But anyway, we spent a fantastic week. And that was where I got my education about what it's like to be in jail and what it's like to be in jail with a lot of people who have great spirit and we were able to get to get to march every day and we started figuring out how to make demands of the warden and we were, the jail was by then so full of us 
that we could usually get our demands made. And we felt that the whole week that we were really a part of the struggle until uh, the judge saw us and let us go in order to make room in the jail for, for the increased numbers of people coming in. So I tell that story because, um, first of all, it was my first arrest, you know, so there's something about the first of anything you tend to remember, right? So I remember that. But also how much of it was un the unexpected. And uh, it, one, one way that I connected to my Quakerism or Quaker practice is that we, we actually make a virtue out of going to spiritual experience in a way that's open to whatever happens rather than it has to be in a particular way. We, we consider that a really positive thing. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really a remarkable symmetry. Go to a demonstration and actually you never do know quite what's gonna happen, right? Or if, you, if it follows exactly a script, then you may not be doing the right thing. <laughs> because maybe it has become a ritual instead of been being a creative action. But um, that's also true of Quaker media. If we go and it all seems like a script, maybe there's something about the way we're approaching it that has turned it into a ritual instead of a, a genuine opening for what might happen. So I see a lot of compatibilities, actually, and that's just one of them, between nonviolent direct action campaigns and Quaker practice. Quakers, actually, in the 17th century, in the earliest days, that's what they were doing. You, you, some of you will know that uh, the Quakers in England declared a jihad on the uh, Puritans in Massachusetts because they found the oligarchical rule, the Puritans were kind of the Taliban of <laughs> North America, uh, was, was intolerable, it was against God's will, and, and they should go over and disrupt it and change it, and they did through a campaign. And ever since, there, there's a whole legacy of Quaker participation in nonviolent direct action and often leadership of in order to get things done. So it seemed to me uh, th this might be a good time for us to fully embrace something that is a legacy um, because our country seems to need more than it's getting in terms of attention for change. And when I uh, travel around and hear people complaining about the situation in our country, one of the things that I hear most often uh, is the, the worry about the division and the polarization. How many of you have heard people re remark on that the last week or two? Yeah, Tremendous polarization that's going on. So uh, I, I do speak to that in the book quite a lot because it's a fundamental aspect of what's going on in this political moment. And I have both good news about it and bad news to share about it. So I'm wondering which you'd like first. <laughs> you want the bad news first? All right. Well, the bad news is that we ain't seen nothing yet. I think it's bad news. It's bad news. There's a trio of political scientists who got very curious about what is it that predicts polarization? Because in some decades, there's very little polarization. There's tremendous consensus. Uh, some of you have heard about or even experienced the 50s, which was bipartisan this and bipartisan that, and the Senate was a club where senators were scratching each other's backs, and it was just all very chummy. Right? There are times when it's been in this country and in many countries a period of consensus and then there are other times when there's this tremendous division and polarization. Well, what accounts for that? And they tried various variables that might account for it and found the one that was most predictive was economic inequality. Economic inequality. You can just predict by knowing which trend is being followed toward less equality, uh, less inequality or more inequality, you can predict how much polarization is going on. Well, we just had passed another tax bill, right? This was uh, in, what, December, uh, which again is going to increase.
increase the amount of economic inequality, which has been trending like crazy, but it's going to accelerate the amount of economic inequality. And so we can safely predict that polarization will continue. There'll be more and more ugliness, more and more not hearing, more and more shouting, and more and more violence. So it's just going to get worse and worse. That would be the bad news. Is that bad enough? I want, I want to qualify for badness here. Okay. Uh, but you probably are curious about the good news. And I've got a lot of good news. Because, well, this came about, actually, I hit upon this by noticing what had gone on in Sweden and Norway and Denmark when I was researching that book, Viking Economics. What was going on for them when they made their turnaround from countries that were a mess to countries that put themselves on a trajectory where now they're at the top of the heap in, in most metrics that you can think of. And so uh, I was very struck by the fact that in each of those countries, the time they made their turnaround was at the time of their greatest polarization. And that's really different from a common impression that people have, well, now we're stuck. Right, because nobody's listening, everybody's screaming, so now we're stuck and we have to try to get civil discourse to happen again so that we can make steps forward. And that's not the evidence from those countries. In fact, it was their period of greatest polarization that they made the greatest leap. Well, that got me thinking about our country. And I got thinking about the first half of the 20th century, the 1930s. What had happened in the 20s? Increasing inequality, increasing, right? The roaring 20s. That was what they were roaring about. The increased inequality. And in the 30s, we had the greatest polarization. Nazis growing, Ku Klux Klan up the wazoo. In the 20s, of course, the Ku Klux Klan leading, the, leading uh, that, that extreme of the spectrum. But then really uh, you know, uh, carrying out more violence in the 30s. Um, tremendous polarization going on in the 1930s. And that was the decade in which the greatest progress was made in the first half of the 20th century in terms of actual achievements. That's when, uh, when we got Social Security of all the basic things you can think of, right? That's when unionization really moved forward. That's child labor laws, just a whole lot of things happened that were really positive in the 30s with polarization. So the, of course I had to then look at the second half of the 20th century. And some of you actually remember the 60s, right? And 70s, tremendous polarization, right? There were parents not talking to their children and children not talking to their parents. <laughs> Enormous problems. Again, Nazis resurgent, right? I remember, uh, I remember going to a demonstration in Washington with um, my then wife Barrett, uh, who was brought up in Norway, and we were, uh, we were uh, all, uh, we were on a street corner. I don't know why the demonstration was on that street corner because there wasn't much room for us. So we were really pretty packed in and listening to James Baldwin uh, the, uh, preaching against the war in Vietnam. And uh, it was totally fascinating. We were uh, standing close together. We were all packed in. I felt her hip against my hip and suddenly I didn't feel it. And I turned and she was falling toward the sidewalk and I grabbed her before her head hit the concrete. And she came to pretty shortly thereafter. And I said, Barrett, what is it? What's up? And she said, look over there. And I looked, and there were a bunch of young men with swastikas on their shoulders. And she had not seen a swastika since she was a girl in occupied Norway when the German Nazis occupied Norway. So she was triggered by a traumatic experience that Norwegians had had and fainted. Yeah, the Nazis were doing well. The Ku Klux Klan, of course, terrorizing. The most coherent, large, longest running terror organization uh, in the US history, right? And uh, tremendous polarization going on in the 60s and the 60s and early 70s was the period in the second half of the 20th century when we made the most progress. 
So how are we to understand this? So I was very puzzled. I mean, I was totally willing to accept the reality of it, but also having trouble trying to make that vivid or understandable, right? And, and on the Viking Economics Book Tour, I was in Glasgow staying with a, a Quaker sculptor, a metal sculptor. And he was really proud of his um, work, and the house was just full of these gorgeous art objects made of metal. And, he's, and uh, he said, of course, I, 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 this is fairly new to me, and it's very hard to work with metal. And I said, well, how do you even do that? And he said, oh, well, I apprenticed with a blacksmith. Let me show you my forge. And he had a workshop in the back of his house, and he very proudly led me and, and showed me his forge and how he would learned from the blacksmith how to deal with metal. Because he said, you know, metal has to get very hot before you can do what you want with it. And I said, thank you. <laughs> You've given us the metaphor we need. Polarization heats up society. It breaks up the crystallizations, the rigidities that hold oppression in place. It makes things volatile. It makes things move like the electrons do. That's as much as I know about that field. Anyway. <laughs> That's what's going on in the 20s and uh, 30s especially, and then the 60s and a bit of 70s, we had the blacksmith's forge working on us, <laughs> right? And that's what the Nordics had going for them. So then the question is, well, why aren't we using it as an opportunity? Instead of regarding it as, oh, well, maybe, you know, if the Democrats get back in, things will get better. And there's no reason to think that things will get better because inequality will continue to grow and therefore polarization will continue to grow. Those are the basic conditions. The forge is very well fueled and it is heating, heating, heating. So what the forge is for is getting us, giving us the opportunity to make the big change at least as big as in the 30s, at least as big as in the 60s and 70s. But maybe we should go further. Maybe we should be more ambitious. Maybe we should make a change as big as the Nordics made in, 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 in their period of time when their societies heated up. Anybody interested in that? <laughs> okay, so then there's the question of how, right? Because the, the way we've been going at social change up until now hasn't really been using the opportunity all that effectively. I think we've done some really good things, but also a lot of it has been sort of one shot, reactive. Something terrible happens, we react. Something terrible happens, we react. You know, oh, another tweet, we react. And, uh, and everybody, everybody who's into the strategy will tell us that reactions don't actually accomplish anything. Uh, Gandhi kept telling his own people, if we just keep reacting to the British Empire, they will be here forever. We have to go on the offensive. It's only on the offensive that it's possible for us to liberate ourselves from the grasp of the British Empire. Gandhi said that. Well, but that's what the generals say too. That's what military generals. Ask a military general, is staying on the defensive a good way to win a war? Or, if you don't believe Gandhi or the generals, consider folk wisdom. The best defense is... Now, if you're willing to stand up to Gandhi, the generals, and folk wisdom, and say, no, defense is the way to go, resistance is lovely, or whatever... <laughs> so... Clearly, there's something about um, the way most people are thinking about this political moment that's really not strategic. It may make you brave and, and, and a, a, a lovely martyr. <laughs> oh, we know that person was on the right side in their heart. But it won't make you effective. And I think, especially with the climate change going on and with the tremendous suffering that's going on for oppressed people, uh, for us to settle for making a witness 
instead of reaching for effectiveness would be a, a hard thing to justify. So, but then the question is, well, what do we do instead? How do we go on the offensive? And I thought, oh, well, thank goodness there's lots of information about that. It just needs to be loaded into a book and we just need to make it available to people and then we can have book study groups and people can launch themselves onto a different framework and off they run. And then we can do what the Nordics did, or at least what people did in the 30s and the 60s in, in the United States. Wouldn't that be cool? And that's where we are at this moment. We've just gotten here. We've just gotten here. That was pretty quick. I think that was pretty quick. Okay, so, uh, wow, I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> we got here already at five after eight. So now's your turn. Now's your turn to ask the hard questions that you want to ask about, okay, what's the content here, George? I mean, even if we change our posture, we go on the offensive, but what does that look like? And, and I would like you to, uh, to ask me as, as probing questions as you want to in order to delve into that question because it's, it, it's a matter of life and death. I mean, ask the people in Squirrel Hill, right? Ask the people in uh, so many parts of our country who are, who are actually losing their lives to uh, a, a, polar, a polarization that is not being responded to as if it's a forge, but is being responded to reactively. So this, the stakes are really high. You deserve to go at me very hard. So to prepare to do that, I'd like you to turn to people near you, wherever you are, and if you're sitting next to somebody you know really well, then make it a threesome or a foursome. And buzz for a little while about how can we really get the juice out of George tonight. Are you willing? Let's go. Hey, I'll bet that you've got something ready. <laughs> I'm so curious about who will be first. <laughs> 
So let's gather together in the uh, whole group and find out what the first question would be. Question or challenge? Love challenge. Would you do that part? Thanks. I so, saw one hand already. Right all right. Yes, is that? Yeah, what, what can we do besides getting arrested? I mean, <laughs> does everybody have to get arrested? What, what are, I mean, you and I have had this discussion before. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I would just rather give you money and let you get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> there is the spirit. <laughs> It's helpful to remember that there are actually four kinds of people. Of course, there are many more than four. But anyway, useful in this in this context, strategic context, there are four kinds of people who are tend to be drawn to different kinds of activities when when responding to you know a situation like ours. And one kind is the kind who gets who's pretty willing to get arrested. We call them the rebels. Uh, and and it, Dr. King would be an example of a rebel, pretty willing to you know, be highly disruptive, right? Uh, but then there are three other kinds of people, too, who are also very, very useful to the movement. Um, one is called the advocate. That's the person who loves to go to people in authority and, and talk to them about, uh, you know, it would make so much more sense if, and so on and so on and so on. So you have lobbyists and you have lawyers and courts and that kind of thing uh, are advocates and then another kind of person you've got is is what uh, can be called helpers or direct service people they love to respond to the issue to the problem in a very direct way if there are people who are hungry get food to them or if this the stream is fouled get you know get a gang of people organize the the Boy Scouts or something, and, or, and clean up the stream. So that's the third kind, is the direct service helper kind. And then the fourth is the organizer. The organizer doesn't care exactly what it is that people do, but he loves to see lots of people doing it together. <laughs> if we have this many people in the room tonight, then next Monday night we should have twice as many people, and the organizer will be very pleased, right? So the organizer likes to organize. Okay, so those are those four roles. Um, so what we find in Earthquaker Action Team is that all four of those kinds of people do join Earthquaker Action Team. And that means that some people never get arrested or only rarely do, and other people are arrested more frequently uh, because other people are busy organizing. Is organizing important? Oh my gosh, right? Um, is somebody willing to uh, talk to and uh, research the authorities with regard to our issue? Is, those people are really important. And also the, um, the, the helper, uh, I mean the civil rights movement, can you imagine how many chicken dinners were cooked by people in basements of black churches in the South? Right, right. And, a nonviolent army travels on its stomach just like a violent army does. <laughs> the people who are there, you know, the people. The sweetest time I ever had coming out of jail was in Washington, D.C. We were released finally at 4 a.m. or something, Michael, and it came out. And the support committee, these were helper kinds of people who had been there waiting all night for us to be released. We came out into the dark, quiet street of Washington, D.C., and there were the, our, our greeters waiting for us with champagne. Yeah. I don't know if that's Quakerly, but anyway, <laughs> it was much appreciated. Anyway, so it's possible to play all those roles within an organization because lots needs to go on in the organization of a campaign in order to make the campaign uh, keep working. So, um, and we're very careful within Earthquaker Action Team, and I do often refer in the book to our practice because we're pretty consciously a laboratory for trying to develop best practices with regard to campaigning groups. Uh, and uh, we're pretty careful not to try to um, give a higher rank to people who are rebels than to the other people because all four of those roles are needed. And we don't, we don't want to be glorifying uh, you know, people who are willing to uh, take the risk of arrest. 
Yeah. Next question. Could I oh. just go ahead with one from our group? It okay. seems to fit with that. Um, for some of the folks who have not read your previous book, and I don't know how many folks there are in the room that that might be true of. Maybe you want to find that out before we ask. How that many question. of you have read the book? Have not read have not read Viking Economics. Have not read Viking Economics yet. Uh, that's good enough to ask the question. Okay. So having studied um, this heavily polarized time, the question arose in our group: What lessons and strategies can you take? from the Scandinavian countries that um, made the difference towards a change in those countries that was made use of that forge that heated up the atmosphere? Great question. One is uh, that in addition to the campaigns, and they did do a lot of nonviolent direct action campaigns, and they were very smart to choose nonviolence rather than armed struggle. Remember, those countries live right next to Russia, right? And they had the example of armed struggle next door and the civil war that followed and so on and so on. And they chose not to do armed struggle, even though, you know, at the, at the time it was kind of conventional thinking, well, if you're gonna go up against your economic elite, they've got the army on their side, you, you're helpless with the army and stuff. They said, no, we think we can handle it. And they did. So they stood up against the army that was employed by the economic elites in those countries and did choose nonviolence as their way of c doing combat, so to speak, and they won. Uh, so, uh, so that was one, one thing that paid off for them. But in addition to campaigns, there were organizers organizing like crazy, especially in the labor movement and in the farm. Farmers were also hard hit in those in the, the bad old days so basically organize to organize the people who feel the uh, pressure most strongly uh, that's really important the role of advocacy was played by the decision by the um, the, the movements in those uh, the people's movements in those countries um, uh, they chose to create political parties and invite people to you know be, be uh, run for office as as uh, parliamentarians, the parliamentary system. Um, the parties, though, that they created were accountable to the movement. So if a member of parliament, um, you know, gets in and then starts having their own ideas, they're, talk they're being sweet-talked by the economic elite or something, and, oh, well, you know, blah, 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 and the movement doesn't like that, the movement would yank them. So it's entirely different from the Democratic Party, which is accountable only to the economic elite, because that's where the money comes from. That's that's the, it, it's an owned and operated <laughs> store by the economic elite. Um, but we, we they have no accountability to us, uh, whereas the movement held the uh, you know held held the uh, held the control on the the advocate types who went into parliament. And then the uh, what's the one I left out? The direct act. Oh, and the, the direct service people were, were uh, co-op people. And they were creating a vast co a network of co-ops and alternative institutions. And we have that going on now in, in our country, right? The new economy, which, which gave life to the vision that they had because they were advancing a vision. They said to, they said to people not just, don't, don't you hate it the way it is now, vote for us, or don't you hate it, you know, do, do join our campaign. They said, no, we have something we want to replace this system with. How would you like this vision that we've got for a worker-oriented economy, for an economy that ran based on the success of the people who actually do the work rather than the people who are the owners. And uh, that, that vision work that they did was really the tipping point. That's what made the difference. Because actually, and when you stop to think about it, when you're just reacting against something, are you at your best? I'm not. I'm at my best when I'm going for positive goals. I mean, most people develop their careers that way, right? They don't just say, I'm so bored being at home, I'll go to college, but I, uh, 
I guess I'll go to college. It's just that I hate being at home. No, you know, it's, and people actually want to go to college. At least they're more likely to do well in college if they actually want to go to college because of some outcome that they have in mind, right? So we've got this funny thing going on in America of being vision averse and therefore saying, oh, we hate this about, and we hate the, whatever it is, you know, the, the denial of climate change or something, instead of saying, what would our country look like if it fully embraced uh, the reality, you know, and did this and this and this and this and this and this. This is how all these institutions would change. So a vision becomes a very, very important thing. And of course, if we did that, if we had a visionary movement, lots of the people who voted for Trump would be on our side. Lots of people. I don't know any working class people who voted for Trump who don't have health issues in their families. And Medicare for all, my brother voted for Trump. We, had, we have great talks about the socialist uh, democracies in the Nordic countries. I never use the word socialist. We talk about the health, health issues in his family. I say, well, it's interesting. Last time I was in Norway, I found out the way that uh, your grandchildren would be, uh, you know, the way the system would respond to your grandchildren is blah, 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 blah. And, and that's hooked into their whole healthcare system, which is blah, 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 blah. And he looks at me and he says, wow, sounds like a plan. Because a vision is, is it's possible with a, with a sensible vision to speak in common sense terms and people will buy it, especially the people who are now being hurt so badly by the system, which uh, uh, Trump has unfortunately uh, you know, gotten some of those votes, some of those. Um, so yeah, so those are some, and then finally I saved this one for last because I think it's, it's so important. Uh, right now there's an argument going on in Philly about what to do about the Proud Boys who are coming. These are these white supremacist, uh, you know, extreme right uh, wing people who are going to come to do their show in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, what the Nordics did was uh, they had their growing Nazi movements and they, they remembered how they remembered who was being recruited into the Nazi movement which was not the powerful people who run the country, but was mostly working class people who were feeling alienated and, well, at least I could feel good about myself as a true Norwegian because I'm Aryan and that means I'm uh, whatever, a Superman or whatever. And, you know, they had all this crazy ideology going. So the status threat that existed at that time was being dealt with in that way, but when, uh, but they weren't the powers. They weren't. They weren't responsible for the system. These folks, right? Well, that's just like the Proud Boys. Or that's just like uh, our, you know, our current equivalents. The Ku Klux Klan has always been most attractive to the people who are regarded as quote losers unquote, right? Um, so the Nordics remembered that, and they said, "Why should we be taking our valuable energy and making a big deal out of them?" when we could be focusing our attention on the people who are actually responsible for our system, which is the economic elite. So they refused to get distracted. The civil rights movement might call it keeping your eye on the prize and not being distracted. Now, I think there's a, there's a second uh, layer to that, which is very easy for us to see. What is it the Proud Boys want? Or maybe you've been in a town where the Ku Klux Klan has shown up, or, or uh, you know, current, current, uh, some current Nazi group or other. What do they want? They want attention. Why give it? Why give them what they want? If you don't agree with them, if you don't sign up for their, their point of view, then why give them what they want? Is that what you do ordinarily in life when somebody comes to you and you don't want them in, their, in your house or you don't, want them, you don't want further association with them and they ask you for something, do you give it to them? 
Maybe you've run into a bully at some point in your life. Have you encouraged the bully by behaving in the way that the bully wants you to? Is that the way to get the bully to stop? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the criticism has been made of our mass media of giving Trump what he wants, which is endless amounts of ink, right? Endless amounts of attention. Why give him what he wants? I walked out of parties with my fellow activists, you know, just partying, socializing at night because people were preoccupied by the latest tweets and the latest things, outrageous things that Trump has done. I've walked out. I am not spending my time giving him what he wants. What he wants is for all of us to be obsessed with his behavior. That for him is a good day. Why, why do you love Trump that much that you would give him what he wants? So for me, uh, the Nordics were able to remember who's actually in charge here of this miserable situation. Who do we have to focus on so we can push them out of power and not get distracted by these folks who aren't running things <laughs> but just want our attention. And that was very, very important to them. That's, again, a reorientation. But it's a reorientation that we need to take if we want to be strategic. And we can't win if we're not willing to be strategic. Uh, John, do you want to pass that? Thank you. Just uh, yeah. a question about uh, the vision mm -hmm. that many people, many Americans have as a rugged individualist mm -hmm. and that they will uh, rise or fall on their abilities and their character as individuals and not as part of a nation, as a collective, and being uh, willing to use their energy, their efforts to support others that may not be doing as well as they are now and to uh, allow themselves to rely on others when they're falling short. It seems to be on that spectrum from individual to a collection or a nation that we seem to fall very much on the side of a lot of individuals and a lot of individuals who aren't doing well now. Uh, how do we get that, that vision of America for most people to move more towards seeing ourselves as a nation in all of this uh, together? Well, one approach is, is to give them a positive experience of working together to get something done. So that's partly the role of the co-ops, right? And other new economy institutions that involve people. Like most people would say, insurance is a good idea. I don't really want to be on my own if my house burns down and I have no, there's, there's no backup for, for me, right? People building houses on the shore where anybody could tell them their house is going to be destroyed, they do want insurance. <laughs> there are lots and lots of examples uh, that people already experience in their lives. And additional goals that people could have, they, they can only achieve if they work collectively. And so that's a place where the helper role is, is very, very important. And also the organizer role. Uh, a lot of times there's just been neglect of, of, that, um, of that sort of common sense understanding. We're going to need to work together in order to get this particular thing done. Um, but I, I find, I mean, having lived abroad in a couple of different countries, that there are very many times when people in this country appeal for help and the, a lot of help is forthcoming, including flooded areas, that kind of thing. In fact, some people raise money f by uh, for paying their medical bills, right, by, by, uh, by using the internet in order to raise money for themselves. So we, we do remain, I think, by and large, the American culture does remain, a, 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 does remain open to collective appeals. But it's, it's often, uh, I think, not, not linked to and wouldn't you like it to be reliable rather than have to do it every time somebody gets sick in your family
My name is Simon James. Thanks for being here, George. I have a two-part question. Um, as we were talking in our group, we talked about this pendulum that we that we saw in your in your description of how inequality happens, and then there's this momentum and movement towards towards the things that that we see as part of this vision for a brighter, more beautiful future. Um, and that pendulum just keeps going back and forth. And there's that static point at the top that doesn't change, and it's holding on to the pendulum. And no matter where the pendulum is. There's, there's that point at the top, which I think is what you're referring to as, as the economic elite. Doesn't matter where on the pendulum we are, the economic elite is still in charge, holding, holding steady. Um, and so what we were talking about is what kinds of uh, paradigm shifts do we need to have to, to break that pendulum? Um, and, and what is it that is at, at the base um, that is holding us back and allowing that pendulum to keep going back and forth um, and sort of growing in momentum. It seems that every time the pendulum swings, it swings a little bit farther towards inequality and more people are, are desperate um, and disparate. And, and then as we swing, we make even more moves towards, um, towards a healthy society. Um, but then it, it just keeps going back and forth. And we see that also in, in politics. Right after Barack Obama, we have Trump elected, mm -hmm. a massive, a massive swing. Um, so, so what kinds of paradigm shifts do we need um, in order to break that cycle? Whether it's, you know, you've talked about the economic shifts from Norway, but what kind of spiritual paradigm shifts do we need? What kind of social paradigm shifts do we, do we need in order to really break that and, 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 and grow into a new society, emerge from the cocoon, as it were, um, and transform into something new? And, and the, second, the second question, <laughs> is a very short one. It's yeah, just if it's, you'd hold it because I'll forget it. It's just why you named it the book "How We Win," but I'll, I'll bring that back. Okay, okay, yeah. Ret let's return to that. Okay, so here's my model of how we can finally get off the uh, the pendulum clock, and that is um, it's a little bit one dimensional because it's going to focus mainly on the campaign aspect. And I said there are these other aspects that need to be done. Um, but this is what the Nordics did. They developed a campaign, and another campaign, and another campaign. Multiple campaigns that added up to a movement. So in, in, their, in their economies, it made sense to organize uh, workers into unions, multiple campaigns, direct action campaigns, strikes, and so on, and also farmers were ready to be organized. So they had uh, campaign after campaign after campaign by the farmers and therefore developed a farmers movement. Um, so the movement of the workers and of the farmers joined each other and in that small country it was sufficient with those two movements to be able to create a movement of movements, that is the joining of them, and that was massive enough to throw out the economic elite to end their dominance and then they wouldn't have to keep doing that swinging back and forth so ever since that time so in uh, say 1931 it came to a point in Sweden where the um, where, where the, 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 this had been going on going on going on uh, the, the movements were growing the movements were talking to each other and then the catalyst was calling out the troops on a labor strike in southern Sweden, and the troops uh, made a massacre, killed a bunch of unarmed, uh, you know, demonstrators, uh, workers. The response of the gen of the uh, labor movement was to call for a general strike, and the others, the labor uh, uh, farmers, middle class people, joined together and did a general strike, and the government fell, and that was the end of the economic elite's dominance. And uh, in fact, the Social Democrats, which was the party of the advocacy people that they had, been, had put in to represent them, ran the, the country then for the next 40 years or so, almost without interruption. By which time, the, uh, the, they, did what, they didn't do what Russia did of like killing the economically, obviously. Uh, uh, they, they made a compromise, which was controversial in its day, uh, which was, we will let you 
uh, continue to manage enterprises that you own, but we will regulate you like crazy, and we will tax you like crazy, and we assert our power by setting the direction of the economy as a whole, which means equality, 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 and and you are and you're just politically no longer running things. So there you are, um, and. And that worked. That that worked. And the and uh, in those countries, the economic elite uh, sometimes makes some forays and looks like it's gaining, and then is pushed back, uh, but has never been able to regain its previous uh, position of dominance. So while they're still swinging, it's swinging like this within the context of a radically changed uh, setup. We can do that. The reason we didn't do it before <laughs> in the 30s because actually we had parallel stuff going on in the 30s we had sharecroppers in the south black and white sharecroppers working together imagine that that was one of the movements that was happening they were doing campaigns and then movements um there were the labor movement of course growing like crazy farmers movements growing like crazy um we, we had this kind of thing going, and we couldn't, though, amass the force needed to do that final job um, because they were still, we were still so uh, culturally fragmented uh, by white supremacy and by, uh, uh, I mean, Irish Catholics were still kind of resenting Italian Catholics. <laughs> there was all this, you know. The Balkans folks were fighting. I mean, there was still an amazing amount of bullshit, I want to call it, in the 30s, right? Uh, that prevented people from developing the collectivity you're talking about, one for all, all for one, and we will now t make the decisive blow and do that. And Franklin Roosevelt, a very gifted politician, realized that he could save capitalism by giving away a good deal of the store making you know concession after concession after concession to the movement of movements that was developing so that the uh, enough people and then of course the war was very handy very handy and so we didn't weren't able to uh, take that step at that time uh, now we actually we're culturally much more homogenous than we were um, the ra racism is considerably less than it was then in the 30s. Um, the the uh, the Irish and the Italians in the, the Catholic Church kind of like each other. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, there, you know, there's been a lot of change. So I think it's not going to be as hard as it was in the 30s to try to make a movement of movements that will push our economic elite out. A lot of the consciousness required has already happened. Poll after poll after poll shows a very big majority of Americans think it's the economic elite that's running our country, that we're no longer a democracy. That is not a liberal, like, you know, oddball idea. That is a very widespread. Lots of Republicans tell pollsters that, oh, yeah, it's the economic elite that's running things. We think a democracy would be better. Very widespread. So a lot of the, that kind of work has been has been going on, but sometimes liberals have been even reluctant to engage people who don't look the same or who don't talk the same or who you know, like I told about the conversation with my brother, who put ideology up front instead of talking with with you know with our people down the street uh, or wherever you encounter them in more practical terms. That enable us to capture the consensus, and of course, and we did make the mistake of not having fully developed a vision. You saw, though, Bernie Sanders, very interesting guy. He didn't put forth a vision quite, like actually say this is what the model would look like, but he did have a laundry list as kind of his substitute vision. Right? He said Medicare, Medicare for all, and uh, free higher education. So he had a kind of list of things that sounded really, really tempting, and he got a lot of working class support, as well as lots of young people's support. And and uh, if the Democratic Party had been organized uh, in a democratic way, um, he probably would have had the nomination. Um, 
which would have been awful for him <laughs> because he would have had all those forces. Some of you remember Jimmy Carter's terrible experience of being isolated in power. He became president for four years and he could, could hardly get anything done. Um, so that would have been Bernie Sanders' experience because we don't actually have a dictatorship. We have, we have a, I mean, the Oval Office is not actually a dictatorship spot. Bernie couldn't have been, a, couldn't have delivered to us what we want. Um, because it's a larger question, it's a larger structure. And that's why not depending on the electoral structure, which is organized here to be the, 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 the sort of mechanism through which the economic elite rules, um, it, it needs to be a much more profound kind of change. And why do I call how we win? Uh, it's partly a, a, an act of defiance. <laughs> Again, against the witness orientation uh, that not only Quakers very often have, that it's sufficient to just say, here I stand, I can do no other, and that somehow that then I feel good about myself and I haven't changed a damn thing. And there's a lot of that that it still goes on, including in London yearly meeting, a, a very long established uh, Quaker uh, told me, took me aside when I spent a year with uh, working with London yearly meeting in 69 and 70. Um, he took me aside, he said, George, there's just something you need to know that when Quakers here say witness, what they mean is stand, uh, uh, what, what they mean is stand up to be counted and then sit down so you don't rock the boat. Oh. Right. So I thought how we win is a way of signaling to people this is not about standing up to be counted. This is about rocking the boat and doing it in such a positive way that we can actually win. Another question. I, I'm, I may have um, heard the answer, but I want to make clear um, that I assume that you're talking about changing hearts and minds in your mm -hmm. campaigns and your movements. And I assume that you're talking about changing the hearts and minds of the, uh, the majority of people. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, what happens to the hearts and minds of the economic elite? Some. Uh, have already changed, actually. Uh, my sweetheart is a millionaire <laughs> and is uh, politically with me, uh, 100%. Uh, <laughs> I, love, I love, yeah, yeah. There's uh, uh, so, some, uh, some children of uh, very wealthy people wrote a book called Robin Hood Was Right. Um, there's a, a movement among wealthy people to, you know, to change things. Uh, so some, some have changed. Some will change in the course of struggle, just as there were white segregationists in the South who changed on racism in the course of the civil rights struggle. And some of them made profound transformational change in their attitudes toward race. Uh, so some will change, but most I think will not. I think most will just uh, really are very deeply attached to privilege and the power and control that goes with that. And they're a tiny minority. What are they? One percent is our phrase. Uh, maybe it's you know maybe it's less than that. Uh, now they have already made provision, according to the New Yorker magazine. Um, many of them have are already investing elsewhere. They are investing in land in New Zealand for mansions and building uh, and uh, landing strips. So they're private planes and getting private planes that can, can make it all the way. And others are investing in condos in missile silos, former missile silos in the Midwest US. Again, that have landing strips alongside so they can, at the moment, you know, when they have to get out of town, they can get out there and security guard infrastructure so that they can defend them, be defended 
live in their silos and be defended against us because their picture this is so important i thought that new yorker article should have every single person should read it many of them know this is not tenable many of them it's not that the economic elite are dumb or uninformed they know the climate science they know this system is not tenable it's not viable they can't pass this country on to their grandchildren in any recognizable form if they continue to hold out the way they are so they know uh you know people are going to march on them with pitchforks or whatever you know i mean the the, the old uh, 17th century uh picture they know the jig is going to be up at some point highly insecure people so they put more and more money into the electoral process have you noticed i mean right more and more and more and more and more economic elite money is going into the electoral process maybe we can stave it off stave off the change another few years another few years but their goose is cooked and so they get the condos and the silos in new zealand and i don't know where else they go uh, because they will make sure that their money protects them and their family you know they'll be okay it's the way they see it they will be okay um but it's total abandonment of us total total abandonment of us um, so I think uh, there were slaveholders who got the message and decided to give up slaves, thank goodness. A lot of Quakers, but not, all, not even all Quaker slaveholders were willing to give up their slaves. So some of the 1% will be these hold, holder outers and that's, so, that's okay. I mean, they have a right to their opinion. I'm sorry? Oh gosh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, anybody else see that? Hmm? Was it more recent than that? But Googling New Yorker uh, condos and silos probably will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> condos and silos. It's quite a concept to, to, to me. I, I don't know. But I wasn't brought up that way. <laughs> John, there's someone else. Thank you, George. When you said heating up, I immediately thought about climate change. You and how does cleansing? climate, climate oh. mm -hmm. change, yeah. that's a kind of heating up that yes, is different is. Yes, from the is. heating up that we've had in the past that's been so positive. Mm -hmm. So I just like your comments on how that plays into all of this and how we should try to deal with that. We had a I had a conversation with Bishop Royster, who was the leader of the interfaith coalition called Power, uh, which is an interfaith and uh, interracial and cross-class coalition in Philadelphia. And uh, I was telling him about Earthquake Action Team's current campaign, uh, which is called Power Local Green Jobs, right? So it is focused on racial justice and economic justice and climate change, all three. This is what he told me, and I think it's so revealing in terms of your question. He said, for three years, he had been talking with his people, he being African-American, most of his people being working class, he'd been telling his people, climate change is going to get us uh, in, in a terrible way, and, and we ought to join that fight. Uh, and uh, because we're the most vulnerable and we will suffer the greatest consequences. And what he kept getting back from his parishioners and, and uh, colleagues and so on was, look, it's not in our face now, it's down the road. We have people coming out of jail now with no prospect for a job. We have the public schools being flushed down the toilet. It, you know, what about my kids? What about these immediate, immediate things? Uh, white people have that issue anyway. Let, they have more power than we do anyway in the society. Let them handle it. So that's the response he was getting over and over and over and over. He gave up because he thought this is just not a, a happening thing um, in his constituency. 
So then he said, but George, then you come in with this campaign design called Power Local Green Jobs. That's our thing. We want jobs. We are job hungry. And of course we want the jobs to be green. We didn't even know that was a possibility. So yes. So he said, give me a couple of months and we'll see what the, the coalition does. Well, the coalition par- t- told us it was partnering with Equate. We didn't ask them to partner with us. We didn't think it, w- it was appropriate because we're mostly white group. We didn't think it's appropriate to talk to black people about why you should join our cause, right? I mean, that seems really presumptuous. But uh, because they know their own priorities. And he, uh, but he called us and said, no, we're, we're in the canoe with you. And I suddenly got this image of, have you, I don't know if you've ever sat by a, ca- a dock in a canoe and somebody twice your weight jumped into the canoe with you. It's, it's, it's pretty surprising. <laughs> uh, because power is a large organization. Equate is a small organization. So the book gets into that question. The book gets into intersectional design. How can we design our campaigns to enable us to work together across racial and class lines? How can we get um, more of this unity that we want down here already built into the character of the campaigns? That will make it way, way easier to follow this trajectory than if we just stay siloed. (laughs) Wrong word. Stay... uh, in our own bubble, right, in the campaigns, and hope that somehow we can sew it all together uh, later, which is going to be very, very tough in any case. So, yeah, so uh, a big part of the book is campaign design looking toward this. So it's really different from the book that Marty Oppenheimer and I wrote 50 years ago for the Civil Rights Movement, which was very, very much, you know, just there you are, sit in her and in Memphis or something and whatever. Uh, this this is is how to do campaigns in such a way as to go go for the whole enchilada, go go for the end of the the swinging back and forth. Yeah, it makes it fascinating. It makes it a kind of art. It makes it a craft, I guess, not an art maybe, but a craft to design our campaigns in such a way as to get what we want. And uh, it doesn't. It, it do, I don't think everybody needs to be a strategist, but I'll bet you know a strategist if you don't happen to be one. You know, maybe uh, the, the person who loves video games or whatever. You know, and uh, sit down with them. The book also shows how to get a group together to be able to launch your own campaign. This will be the last question. Um, George, bringing it back to vision, I'm wondering if you can share anything that comes to your mind about sort of the framework or scaffolding of a vision that you feel will speak in the U.S. to this really polarized moment um, and that speaks to the economic inequality as well as the urgency of climate change. Just where where do you look for the scaffolding of that vision? Mm. Big question. Uh, so my mind immediately goes to Vermont, where people did study groups on Viking economics and thought, whoa, we're capable of developing a vision. And just a few weeks ago, they had a statewide summit, vision summit, with over 100 Vermonters, leaders from all over Vermont, getting together, spending the day, how shall we create a vision for Vermont? We don't, we're not quite ambitious enough yet to create a vision for the country. Let's create one for our state. And then, you know, maybe New England, you know, and, and build our vision, visioning skills. Um, and I, I keep uh, be, being very impressed by Gunnar Myrdal's, uh, he was an economist, a Swedish economist, his insight that people want to work. And therefore, we should put the honoring and the empowering of people working at the center of our vision. And that that was a big departure from the economics of his day. This is way back. Uh, he, he got his PhD in, on his dissertation on that and then got the Nobel Prize because it was so innovative to be thinking. Because usually, what do we re- find out about every day in our, in our, in our media is uh, Wall Street. How's Wall Street doing? How's Wall Street doing, right? And oh, we've had this immense recovery 
because Wall Street's recovered, right? In other words, it's the well, welfare's capital, it's the well-being of capital that is the center of our economics and has been for a long time. So he flipped it upside down. He said, uh, you know, we'll pay some attention to capital, but first and foremost is the well-being of people producing, people serving, people reproducing, people, you know, that's the center of the economy. And when those, well, what does that mean? That means people deserve the training that will enable them to do good jobs, right? So free training, of course. What if the job needs a college education? Free college education, of course. Well, what if I want to be a doctor? Well, free medical school, of course. Of course. <laughs> because we want to maximize, yeah, but I don't know about the long hours of, you know, medical school and residencies, what is it, 60 hours, 80 hours a week or something like that. No, 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 no. What is the supports the well-being of workers is rest. So the Nordics, what do they have? Five, six, five, six weeks of paid vacation. Americans are working more and more and more. That's the trend. More and more hours. They are working less and less. They're trying very hard to get for below 40 hours a week to 35 hours. And the 35 hour a week people are working to get to 30 hours a week. And they're finding themselves to be more productive in 35 than they were in 40. And more productive in 30 if they've been used to working 35. And so on and so on. They are just they are just like on a whole other level because they are putting themselves first as productive workers. Of course, excellent health care available for all because a more healthy society is a more productive society. So their economic performance beats the United States year in and year out, decade in, decade out. The Nordics outperform American economic performance and they do it by investing in the worker of course women should enter the workforce uh, you know if they want to and therefore there should be uh, you know all kinds of support for that daycare you know, you're if you're a nursing mom you are paid for the hours you spend nursing while you're on the job you take that time off you go to the crash the nur you know the nursery in the job and you nurse and you are being paid for that time because those babies are future workers <laughs> and of course we invest hugely in immigrants who come to our country and of course they get free university and free this and free that and free everything because they are the future of our labor force because we put them first so that I think is a, is like a, a beacon it's just such a such a reversal it's so innovative and so brilliant and there's a lot of innovations that are brilliant but don't work out and it outperforms. So let's go with that. This has been such fun chatting with you, and uh, I'm eager to hear all the rest, but I'm also eager to sign my name in your books. <laughs> Thank you so much, George. Let's give him a very big round. Thank you so much. <laughs> you. Always well spent. <laughs> Thank you. I know you probably still have some questions for George that are maybe burning, um, but I invite you to go out to the table uh, where he will be signing books. Um, he's accepting cash or checks made out to George Lakey. Um, $17 is the price of the book. I'm sure it is well worth it as you want some of the answers that we weren't able to get to in our Q&A. So I invite you to enjoy some refreshments, meet with George, buy his book, and uh, we will be meeting uh, next first Monday of December, uh, Lynn Back, known to many of you um, as a local Quaker, uh, strong connection with Pendle Hill, and uh, she will be talking about her experience in the former Yugoslavia during the before, during, and after the NATO bombing and what what support she received as a Quaker to follow her leading to go and do work in that area.
So I invite you to come back for that. And um, thanks so much for coming out tonight. It was really great to have you all here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.